reading this morning is from Joshua 1, verses 1 through 3 and 5 through 9. Moses served the Eternal One faithfully until the end of his days. After his death, the Eternal singled out Joshua, the son of Nun, who had walked at the right hand of Moses during the wilderness wanderings. The Eternal One said to Joseph, uh, to Joshua, since my service, Mo, servant Moses is now dead, you and the Israelites must prepare to cross over the Jordan River to enter the land that I have given you. I will give you every place you walk, wherever your feet touch, just as I promised Moses. No one will be able to oppose you for as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses, and I will never fail or abandon you. So be strong and courageous, for you will lead these, this people as they acquire and then divide the land I promised to their ancestors. Always be strong and courageous, and always live by all the law I gave to my servant Moses, never turning from it, even ever so slightly, so that you may succeed wherever you go. Let the words from the book of the law be always on your lips. Meditate on them day and night, so that you may be careful to live by all that is written in it. If you do, as you make your way through the world, you will prosper and always find success. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Never be afraid or discouraged, because I am your God, the Eternal One and I will re remain with you wherever you go. And then in Joshua chapter 3. So Joshua called the Israelites together. Come closer and hear what your God, the Eternal, has to say. Today you will see a sign that the one true living God is present among you, the God who will without doubt drive out all of this land's inhabitants. Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Parasites, Kirkishites, Amorites, and Jebusites. The covenant chest of the Lord of all the earth will pass in front of you into the Jordan River. Now, select twelve men, one from each tribe of Israel. When the priests who bear the covenant chest of the Eternal, who is Lord over all the earth, step into the river, then you will see the waters of the Jordan stop as if behind a wall. So the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the covenant chest before them. During harvest time, the Jordan is swollen, running over its banks. But when the priests stepped into the river's edge, the water stopped, piling upstream at the city of Adam, near Zarephon, while the water flowing downstream toward the Sea of the Arabah, the Dead Sea, ran out. Then the Israelites crossed the Jordan opposite the city of Jericho, walking on dry land just as Moses had led their ancestors from Egypt. While the Israelites crossed on the dry riverbed, the priests who carried the covenant chest stood firmly in the middle of the Jordan until the last Israelite had crossed over. When the last one had crossed the Jordan, the Eternal One spoke to Joshua. Some of the twelve men you chose from the people, one representing each tribe, and tell them to take twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan riverbed, where the priests stand with the covenant chest. Tell them to carry these stones this day, and when the people make camp tonight, to lay them down. Joshua did just as he instructed, and summoned the twelve men who had been chosen from the Israelites to represent the twelve tribes to give them instructions. Go back into the Jordan River bed to the covenant chest of the Eternal your God, and each carry a stone upon your shoulder, twelve stones for the twelve tribes of the Israelites, so that we may build a memorial of this day. Someday your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? And you will tell them Israel crossed the Jordan here on dry ground. For the Eternal One, your God, dried up the waters of the Jordan until you crossed over, just as he held back the Red Sea for our parents until they crossed, so that everyone on earth would know how powerful the Eternal is, and so that you would reverence your God, the Eternal, forever. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>
protect what matters. Protect what matters. Today, we're going to be in the book of Joshua. Everybody say Joshua. Joshua. Yeah, chapter 7 of the story. I hope you're all reading this story. We're going to be in the book of Joshua. And chapter 7 deals strictly with Joshua. Strictly with the book of Joshua. And Joshua is filled with all sorts of things. And I could, uh, I could tell the story quite a bit, and then we've, we've done that. Um, I could talk about the, the, the background that led up to this point, and, and we did that a little bit. Uh, but today I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to look at three phrases, three words, three phrases, that I think help frame out this idea, the main idea, the theme, the root, the heart of Joshua, which is protect what matters. Three ideas. Are you ready? The first phrase is, do not be afraid. Now, this is one that we've looked at a few times, right? Uh, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about Joseph. He said, do not be afraid, right? Uh, we know that this phrase, do not be afraid, or something like it, appears roughly 365 times in the Bible. This particular phrase <coughs> appears five times. Everybody say five times. Five times. Five times in the book of Joshua. So it's fairly important. One instance where this word, this phrase, do not be afraid, appears is in Joshua chapter 1. Starting uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to Joshua 1 9. If you don't have a Bible or if your Bible is in too small a print, here you go. Joshua 1. Verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you? God is talking to Joshua. He says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Two different sides of the same coin. Right? Uh, how many people celebrated Halloween? Yeah, some of you don't want to admit that you dressed up for Halloween. <laughs> but we all know better. This is not spooky. Okay? It's not that type of afraid. It's different than that. Uh, the first word, do not get terror, right? Uh, it has this idea of do not fear. Um, uh, do not be afraid. Do not be terrified. Do not. Uh, another way to think of it is do not awe something. Not all. A W B. Do not put it in God's place. Because he is the only being to be feared. The one who speaks universes into existence. The one who can decide whether we go to heaven and hell. The Bible says, don't be afraid of the one who can kill you. Be afraid of the one who can cast your body into hell. Do not awe. Do not put anything in my place for the Lord your God will be with you. God says, don't be afraid of anything else, because I'm going to be there, and I'm the only thing you should be afraid of. Do not be discouraged, he says. The <laughs> word discouraged is different than the word terrified in the original language. I couldn't try and give you the Hebrew, but I would spit all over the communion table trying to pronounce things, so I'm just going to save that for another day. That word there, discouraged, in the original language... Uh, it can be described as do not be afraid, uh, but it can also be defined as do not break. Do not be shattered. Do not be so uh, weak or, or fragile. Uh, you know, it, if, you, if you hear somebody has glass knees, right, they're, they're terrified of something. Do not be afraid. Do not be fragile. Do not be shattered. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do not be afraid. That phrase occurs five times in the book of Joshua. Now, we all know that uh, our lives are a reflection of what we believe about God. We've talked about this in a couple different angles, right? Uh, how we act around other people is a reflection of how we relate to God. How we uh, love other people is a reflection of how we interpret God's love for us. And so we are some sort of mirror, some sort of reflection of who God is. And people see that. They do. People are watching all the time. If you don't believe me, turn on the news. Christians are getting a bad rap. Right? 
And it's not because we're doing anything differently than other people. It's because we're not doing anything differently than other people. And yet we claim to. Uh, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not awe somebody. Do not awe something. Don't put it in my place, God says. Don't be so fragile, so frail, so breakable. Don't shatter. Because a shattered mirror gives a broken reflection. If fear dictates who we are, if we spend every waking moment afraid of this or that, if we are shattered or scared all the time, then our reflection of who God is will be broken. Really? You serve the God of the universe and you act like this? You serve God Almighty and you're scared of that? A shattered mirror gives a broken reflection. Everybody with me so far? We're going to fly, so I hope, it's, I hope you're buckled in. All right. The second phrase. The first phrase was, do not be afraid. Everybody say afraid. afraid. The second phrase that helps characterize this idea in Joshua, protect what matters. The second phrase is, be strong and courageous. Everybody say strong. Strong. And courageous. Courageous. Yeah. Be strong and courageous. Now, this phrase appears five times. Everybody say five times. Five times. See, I'm making this easy on you. Five times in the book of Joshua. Five times. It occurs three out of those five times in chapter one. God's call to Joshua. Joshua is a young leader. Right? We'll touch on the lower story stuff. Joshua is a young leader taking, for, uh, taking over for an established leader in Moses. Moses just died. Uh, after he went up on a mountain and was told he can't go into the promised land. He had spent 40 years plus wandering with a bunch of complainers. And he himself gives in to that. And God says, all right, well, you, you want to be like them? Fine. You don't get to go in the promised land. Joshua's going to take them. So Joshua is now in charge of this group of millions of people. The second generation. And God, in his calling, in his commission to Joshua, reminds him to be strong and courageous. Now, this word strong, the word strong is, uh, it's like concrete. You ever work with concrete? Uh, I remember when uh, we were doing a bunch of work at my, at my parents' house, we were laying some stonework on one of those molds you just pour concrete into. And we would pour, uh, mix together this concrete, which is just sand and rocks, and you put some water with it. And you pour it all into this mold, and it's real goopy and gross, and, and it's not, you set something on it that's going to leave a mark, you know, I don't know if you were a kid, you put your hand in there, and write your name, do all sorts of stuff. It's weak like that, but once it sets up, once it hardens, once it firms up, you can walk on it. It's strong, it's hard, it's stiff, it's, it's very much different than being shattered, or fragile, or broken. Do you see the, the, the other side of this? Maybe concrete's not your thing. Maybe you need a more lively example. Okay? I'm, I'm going to ask my volunteer to come up at this time. I better take my coat off of this. Chance? Yep. You play football. Uh, what position do you play? Offensive and defensive line. Offensive and de defensive line. Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of time as an offensive lineman, right? Yep. And uh, pretty successful at it, as I heard last night. Congratulations. Now, Chance, uh, here's the thing. I'm pretty strong. <laughs> 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 I may have a tie and dress shoes on, but I think I can knock you over. <laughs> None of you believe me. <laughs> Alright, so here's what we're going to do. Chance, I want you to go ahead and take, strike the, the pose if you can. I know you're in dress clothes, so Alright, you ready? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm... <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I, I'm, uh, 
have to second guessing myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I, I just I got to up. All right. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm ready now. Um, hey, but I'm going to get a run of this. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, just sit down. Integrity 
and treat others with respect and should call out his children to become responsible men and women who live their lives for what matters in eternity. Protect what matters. In Joshua chapter 1, 6 through 9, we read a little bit of it earlier. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Did you catch what God said is the most important thing? The thing that matters. The thing that needs to be protected. He copes this with the be strong and courageous. And in the middle, do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. All these rules, all these memories, the book of the law, that's Genesis through Deuteronomy. And it has the Ten Commandments. It has all these other commands about how to do things, how to clean things, how to order things, how to live as a godly nation. But it's also about stories. It's about memories of the past, of how you've been brought out, how you've been delivered. It's a booklet commemorating 125 years of how God has been faithful in your journey up to this point. Be strong and courageous. Protect what matters. Last week, last week, uh, Brett Mitchell delivered his testimony about wandering, about uh, some times in his life where he was trying to put other things in the place that only God can fill. And if you weren't here last week, I highly encourage you to grab a CD or DVD or watch that online. But the, the phrase from last week is if we're always searching for what we don't have, we'll never find it. The sidebar to that, the, the side effects to that is if you're always searching for what you don't have, you'll lose what you do. Just ask wives and mothers and children of families where the men have gone astray because of their own desires, their own addictions, their own cravings. Protect what matters. Everybody still with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. The third phrase, the third idea, the third thought. It helps fill out and uh, describe this idea, the main theme in Joshua, protect what matters, is that little word, destroy. Everybody say destroy. 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 And a lot of times in Joshua, you'll see this, not just by itself, but you'll see completely destroyed, totally destroyed, utterly destroyed. I'm going to read a text that doesn't see much hair time in churches. This is exciting, aren't you ready for that? Joshua chapter 10, um, starting at verse 24. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, Come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. And so they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hung them on five trees, and they were left hanging on the trees until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave, they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. That day, Joshua took Micaiah. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors. And he did to the king of Micaiah as he had done to the king of Jericho. Now, 
If I had left the building, everybody would go, well, but, hey, wait, you got to explain that. That doesn't jive with my understanding of who God is. The God of forgiveness, the God of love, one slow to anger, abounding in love. The, 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 the God who says love your enemies, the God who uh, wants the whole world, all men to be saved. How does that God and this God fit? Joshua is the leader of a new nation, God's people. The prototype of what it means to have a relationship, a personal, intimate relationship with the God of the universe. And so he's protecting them. And for this people at this time, he is fulfilling a promise. They need a land. They need a place to be. And as we Americans know, sometimes the land that we want is occupied by other people. Too soon? And so, God says, look, I'm going to be with you. And you can't just have these people around. You're going to have to go in. You're going to have to clear them out. Everything. Don't keep anything for yourself. Don't leave anyone standing. We think how barbaric. How inappropriate. How bloodthirsty. The difference is we live on this side of Jesus. See, before that, there was judgment. Wages of sin is death. At this point in human history, for this people, at this time, deliverance meant that they had to go through people who opposed God. And don't get me wrong, these people did oppose God. <laughs> they did all sorts of wicked things. They would, uh, they would offer their sons and daughters in the fire as a sacrifice to their gods. Child sacrifice. They would prostitute themselves, literally, in their temples as worship to God. Can you imagine a church service for like that? It's okay to do these people were doing things that was not God-honoring. They were sinning. <clears throat> and if God, as we learned last week, isn't afraid to whoop up on his own people, don't think for a second that he's not going to take care of those who are blatantly sinning. Some of you are still looking at me. That's still too barbaric. I don't get it. I don't like it. I understand. Let me give you an example. Spring of 2012, I was at work. I lived about 20 minutes away from our home. I was working about 20 minutes away from our home. And my wife called me on the phone in a panic. And she said, somebody just tried to break into the house. Well, if any of you know me, you know as soon as I heard that she was in a panic, I was halfway out the door. But then when I heard what had happened, I had that Papa Bear protective He-Man type of mentality. So I fly home. We protect what matters. Right? If somebody came and they threatened my son, they threatened my wife, going to do whatever it takes to protect them. Even if it's at great personal cost to me. Some of you are still looking at So how about this? We'll go biblical. That seems like the right thing to do. That word destroy can mean a couple things. It can mean devote. It's interesting. Devote. Dedicate to God. 
Give to God what is God. It can mean surrender completely. Complete surrender. Complete setting down of everything. Or it can mean root out. Root out. I remember working for my grandpa one summer. That was all I could handle. <laughs> Love him to death. Worked for my grandpa. He was a big gardener. Not that he was a big gardener, but he thoroughly enjoyed gardening. Uh, <laughs> he loved the garden. He knew everything about the garden. In and out, every inch of his garden, he knew. He knew how to make things grow. He knew how to make things die. He knew how to do everything that he needed. He was very creative, very intuitive. And so I needed a little extra money, so I said, I'll work for him. And he, I, one of the first days, he said, look, I need you to get out there. I need you to pull the weeds. Okay. So I'm going through and I'm pulling weeds. He says, what did you do? I told you to pull the weeds. I did. No, you didn't. You just pulled the tops off the wall of them all the way down. You gotta get down there. You gotta pull the whole thing out. You gotta make sure you get the root of the weed out. Otherwise, it will strangle. Are you with me? It will strangle the plants that we are trying to protect. Jesus tells a story of a sower sowing seed. He throws seed all over the place. Some of the seed lands in rocky soil. It doesn't grow. Birds eat it. Some of the seed lands in good soil, and it grows and it produces crops and all sorts of things. Uh, some of the seed lands where there are weeds, and as you know, the weeds strangled plants that grew. Here's the thing that we know. Weeds can crack even the strongest concrete. If you need an example, just walk on the sidewalks out here. It doesn't matter how many times we pull them. It doesn't matter if we spray or what we do. It seems like weeds are always springing up and they crack this concrete. This concrete that used to be solid and steady and firm. But if they're left unattended, if they're allowed to grow, if they're allowed to pester, if they're allowed to irritate, they will cause the concrete that you work so hard to firm up to crumble. So where are you allowing weeds to grow? That's what this word destroyed means for us today. See, every time that the people went into a city, if they didn't do this, when God said do it, if they didn't do it, it caused trouble for them later on. Not just on a physical level, but on a spiritual inner level. Where are you allowing weeds to grow? Now, before we leave here today, I want to be very clear. This is not a mandate for us to go out and kill everybody who doesn't worship the same way that we do. Because we live on this side of Jesus. It is a call to be aware of the areas in our own life that we haven't fully surrendered to God. Protect what matters, no matter the personal cause. Even, even if it costs your life. Jesus, God in flesh, came to this earth for one reason. The reason. The purpose of creation, the heartbeat of God, to be reunited with us. The only way that that was going to happen is if somebody took this judgment, this wrath, this penalty of sin. And so God himself, the God whom we call barbaric, the God whom we say, well, he's bloodthirsty, how could he do this? That same God shed his own blood for all of mankind. Beaten, humiliated, spat on, 
crucified, murdered for you, for me. Because he believed in this one principle, you protect what matters. You matter to God. Because you do. It cost him his life. The battle begins today, right now. Where are you letting weeds grow? Are you protecting what matters in your home, in your own soul? Are you still searching for the things that don't matter? God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. And God, I pray that you would sure up our defenses. If there are things in our life that are bad, that are not God-honoring, help us to rid ourselves of those things. Because they will just cause uh, our lives to crack and splinter and shatter. If we're settling for good when we could have great, help us devote our lives towards your greatness. God, you care deeply about us. Help us to protect the things that you value. Not the petty things that fall away, that turn to dust, but the things that have eternal value. Help us to protect what matters. Father, we thank you for Jesus who set the bar for the rest of us, who saved us from our own wickedness. We thank you for him. And it's in his name that we